That said, let's dive in. If you've got your Bibles, uh, we're going to turn to Hebrews chapter 1. But as you're turning there, um, one of my favorite things about kids is when they get excited. One of the cutest and favorite things about kids is when they get excited about things. And my daughter, Posey, who will be three in January, gets excited about trains. Like she loves trains. And the train that she actually loves the most is the RTD train in Old Town, the one, the commuter train that picks everybody up. And anytime we go downtown and she hears the bells and the ringing, she's like, train, train, daddy, we got to see the train. And she will break her neck to see the train, okay? And she's super, super excited about it. And when the train comes, she's like, train, train, hey, train, hey, hey, hey. And I'm like, not that enthusiastic about it because I've seen it a thousand times and I actually know what goes on on the those trains. And so <laughs> I'm not as excited about it as she is, but she loves that train. Or maybe another way of saying it is she's beholden to that train. And she wants others to behold that train. I'm not excited about it, but she wants me to behold that train. And I think the word beholden or behold is the perfect word to describe her excitement because it it, it describes just the excitement that she wants. And the word behold is defined this way. It means here, there, look, with an exclamation point. It says, now. It's a marker used to liven a narrative, change scene, emphasize an idea, and call attention to a detail. And I think that's a perfect word for what Posey is trying to do. She's trying to behold the train and get others to behold it. And I share that story in that word with you today because that word is found in the carol that is uh, the subject of our series today. We're doing a series called Carols or Advent and Carols where we take a carol that we sing and find the theological truth from that and apply it for us today. It's like bringing out the truth of these familiar, familiar carols that we sing. And behold is found in O Come All Ye Faithful based on a passage in Luke 2. Let's bring that up in King James Version. And the angel said unto them, fear not, for what? Let's say it together, behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Is that the last one we got? For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior, which is Christ the Lord. And that carol gets the word behold from that verse. And that is found in the first verse of the song. It says, O come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the king of angels. And this line is what we're going to base today's sermon off of. Typically, we go through a book of the Bible, but for Advent, we're doing kind of an off series. And this series here, we're going to break down this song and see that there are three invitations that this song is inviting us to see. Come and behold is an invitation. And the three invitations are this. Come and behold, he's king of angels. We see in verse one. Come and behold, he's Christ the Lord, which is verse two. And in the last stanza, we see come and behold, he's word of the Father. And this is significant for us to, to see this and even like ponder or even think about, contemplate this carol that we maybe take for granted because the invitation here is imperative because we need to have continual wonder to behold Jesus, to have this look, see, hear, now, put your attention to Jesus. It's our aim as his followers and as a church, TLC, to see him as our first love. We can get distracted by things but we need to be reminded of this invitation to come and behold. That said, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter one, as we see the first invitation is to behold him as king of the angels. And this comes from verse one, where it says, come and behold him, born the king of angels. Hebrews one, starting in verse one. Long ago, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these days, he has spoken to us by his son, Jesus. God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After, marking, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high 
on, on high. Here's the key line. So he became superior to the angels, just as the name he inherited is more excellent than theirs. The theme of Hebrews, okay, is all about the superiority of Jesus. We don't know the author of Hebrews. It's speculated who this might be, but the whole point the author is trying to make to his audience, which is a Hebrew one, okay, a Jewish audience, is um, to make the case that Jesus was superior to all things. And starting with angels is important because angels in the Hebrew culture, in the Israel religion or Jewish religion, Angels are seen very important. It's a very important part of their faith. And angels were very important because they saw angels mainly uh, contributing to the coming of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai with Moses. So angels were a part of delivering that. And so they see them very important, a part of their faith. And one theologian said this about angels in the Jewish faith. In Israel, the underlying conception of the heavenly world was that of a royal court. Yahweh, which is Lord, was envisioned as king. Just imagine that. Yahweh, our God, is king. They're seeing him as that. And at his service were divine beings who served as counselors, political subordinates, warriors, and general agents. These divine beings were often referred to as a collective group and were understood to constitute a council. In other words, Israel the Jews saw Yahweh as a king in a heavenly realm with a supernatural team of people and with supernatural powers. They were like a divine employees, okay? They were divine employees for God and they were working for him. Now, we have no idea what these angels look like or how they would operate. However, we can be sure that the Israel, just like the Israelites, we too can believe that they're relevant for us now. Like angels are with us today. They're in the heavenly realm doing God's work then and now and fighting on our behalf. And several times in the New Testament, how we can know this to be true, in the New Testament, angels are referred to as guardians or angels beings that minister to us as humans. And again, there's a lot on the subject that we don't know about and that we could probably dive into for a longer sermon, but that's not the point of this. I share this, uh, I share this to set up the notion that angels are real and supernatural. And if that is true, then the next thing is if they're supernatural, then they have power and might beyond our comprehension, all right? Supernatural things blow our minds. They're supernatural. But the whole point of the scripture and the line in the song is this, is not to get lost in the details of what angels are or what they do in the sense of day to day. It's there to set up a contrast. It's there to set up the contrast. The author of Hebrew wants their audience and us to think upon the might of angels, to see how mighty they are, how supernatural they are, how like beyond our comprehension they are. Then to see in light of that, Jesus is bigger than them. In other words, if you think angels are great, if you think they're great, imagine who is much greater than the one, uh, than the one who actually created them. They're great, but think of the creator of the angels. No created thing can get more glory or recognition, recognition than its creator. For example, the Mona Lisa. It's a beautiful, iconic, incredible piece of work. And many people can line up day after day and look at that piece of art. The Mona Lisa will never get more recognition than who? Leonardo da Vinci. A created thing can never get more glory or honor than its creator. And the same is true with Jesus. And we see in Colossians 1.16, he's the creator of all things in heaven and on earth. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth. That means angels, the visible and the invisible. Angels, whether thrones or dominions or rulers, rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. We can guarantee that Jesus created angels. He's above them now and always. The creator is always above the created order. And the angels know this to be true too. Because when baby Jesus was born in the manger and the angels arrived, what do they do? They bow. They know who is superior, even in the form of a baby. And the whole point of this church is to see from this song the invitation of coming to behold. 
to come and see, to adore Jesus, the one who is above all things. Sunday evening, Lacey's uh, grandmother and mom came into town to visit, to kind of see and our two girls. And on our second to last night, we went to Tap and Doe, which is a restaurant in Old Town. And afterwards, we because it got dark, we said, let's go see the tree because we didn't get to go see the tree lighting uh, the week before. And so after we ate, we walked down there. And if you're familiar with where Tappendo is, you have to walk probably about a block before you can see it down Old Wadsworth going north. So we're walking, it's very cold. And then the anticipation is coming, 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 coming. And then we finally get to the edge of Old Wadsworth. And then all, almost simultaneously, we see the tree and we go, wow in awe of the tree. In TLC, this invitation to come behold the king of angels is prompting us to have the same reaction. Wow, God, you are amazing. You are on your throne. You're seated on high. You're the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the beautiful name, the wonderful name. You are King Jesus above everything. You are higher than the angels, higher than any political might. You are Jesus. We love you. Wow. And what this carol is inviting us to is the same invitation of scripture. It's inviting us to come and behold the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, to have neck breaking awe and wonder of who is in control. So TLC, this season, this Christmas season, it should be 365 days out of the year, but this season and this whole series is about reminding us to come and behold the King of Angels. TLC, may you and I behold Jesus as the supreme king of angels. And just like last week, and we're going to do this again, I reminded, or I, I kind of set this up. I'm going to be preaching the first and third point of this sermon, but we have someone from our team that's going to be preaching the second one. And today we have Brandon Witter, who's our worship and tech director, who's going to continue our second point. And I want to invite him up as he talks about how we have the invitation of beholding Christ the Lord. Let's give it up for Brandon. Thank you, Justin. It's uh, good to be with you. TLC, here we go. Good morning. It's good to be with you all. Uh, let's begin on this point of beholding he's Christ the Lord by reading Philippians 2, 9 through 11. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that here's where the emphasis, Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. When Justin asked me to give a short message on this theme of beholding Jesus Christ as Lord, my first question was, okay, what does the word Lord actually mean? The word Lord, as it turns out, in the original biblical language, in the Greek, is kurios, which means supreme in authority, controller, and by implication, master. Paul knew the reaction he might get from this when he was addressing the church in Philippi. And this is Philippi. At the time, it was a prominent Roman colony in Caesar's empire, and the people of Philippi were fiercely loyal to Caesar, to the point of worshiping sometimes, oftentimes. To the Philippians, Caesar was their lord. When Paul wrote, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, he knew exactly who he was addressing this to and who the majority of the Philippians called Lord in their city instead of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in our city, in Denver, who do the majority of people today call as Lord? I would argue themselves. People want to be their own kurios, in control of their own destiny and the supreme authority in their own lives. But church, I want to say it's not just unbelievers who do this. It's we naturally want to make ourselves our own lords. And a way that we do that is by making plans for ourselves without being willing to let God intervene and guide us along the way. And I am a perfect example of this. Uh, growing up, 
in high school, I knew exactly what I wanted to do, which is not very many people, I think, in my circles can really say that. Uh, I knew that God had a call in my life to worship ministry, and I got that. But then I said, okay, God, I'll take it from here. I've got the plan. I was going to do four years of college. I was going to uh, graduate, have a family, go back to Michigan where I grew up, have a church there. And God basically just said, you are hilarious. Uh, So I went to college for a few years and then had to transfer and then didn't have enough money to come back and then had to take an extra year. And uh, in all of this, um, it was very tumultuous for me because I w- I'm like to have my plans set before me of like, okay, I am the own Lord of my own destiny. I like to make my own plans go my own way, but God had another plan. Even after that, I graduated. I worked at a church in uh, the Virginia where I attended while going to college as the worship ministry pastoral assistant. And I said, okay, here's the plan. I'm going to be here forever, and uh, it's my dream job. This is going to be great. And God again said, you are hilarious. Uh, lost that uh, job um, due to a lot of different circumstances, but we left on great terms. And God said, no, you're going to Denver, Colorado. And God has worked in more ways than I have time to talk about now. But the point is, see, while God was having a direct calling on my life, I basically told him, I'm hearing the calling, I've got the basic idea of the destination, I'll take it from here. Without taking into, into consideration that this crazy, winding journey of faith ahead causes me and others that observe to look at the journey and behold that Jesus is Lord of my life. You might be asking at this point, why do I even need this Jesus as a supreme authority in my life. I'm doing just fine on my own. Are you sure about that? What happens if you lose your job, a loved one dies, your health fails, or any other countless catastrophes strike? Are you able to find joy in yourself when those things happen? Or does finding the source of joy in God the Father cause all other troubles to fade away? Everything in my life and the lives of so many others has proven that nothing is better than the joy that comes from having a relationship with God. So the follow-up question is, how do we as a church behold Jesus Christ as Lord? The first step is to recognize it doesn't stop at the moment of salvation. As Pastor Justin likes to say, we never get past this. We need to remind ourselves daily that the gospel is still working on us to stir our love and affections towards him so we can declare that he is Lord, set our eyes on his glory, and consciously submit to his lordship daily, not ours. None of us will perfect this, but the goal is to strive to do it daily, not in our own strength, but in the strength of Christ. The goal is to become aware of temptations and dangers out there looking to steer us away from submitting to Christ. The second step is to get comfortable with things being out of your control. I hate this. (laughs) This is done by making it a habit of acknowledging that God is the one in control. This results in lasting peace in beholding Jesus as Lord. Out of all the attributes of God, his lordship should give us the greatest hope and peace, knowing that even when bad things happen, we don't understand why and may never understand why. We can have faith that God is still sovereignly in control, works all things for his glory and our good, and will make things right in the end. The third step to beholding Christ as Lord is to ask God where you need to give up your own lordship. Prayer is the perfect way to look at ourselves in the mirror. And when you find areas to let go control of, just pray something like, God, this is yours. I put my faith and trust in you as Lord over this area or this thing in my life. The final step is to find the fingerprints of his lordship in your life and in scripture. So you can behold him as Lord in fresh ways that draw you closer to him. There are countless, countless examples of this in scripture and in life. But the best place to start is with the gospel. For example, 
Behold that he is Lord when he came down to earth as a tiny baby. Behold him as Lord because he gave his life on a cross in order to pay the ultimate price for your sins and mine and was raised three days later, giving us the ability to personally behold him as Lord by tearing down the wall of separation that sin caused. Behold him as Lord because he sent his Holy Spirit to us to prod our hearts and make us sensitive to his word so that we can choose to accept his son, Jesus Christ, as Savior. Behold him as Lord because he has chosen from his holy of holy thrones to reach down through this gospel of everlasting love to pick you up, make himself Lord of your life despite yourself. Behold him as Lord because he placed his Holy Spirit in you and I so that we, when we inevitably fail again and again and again and again, Jesus can say, my grace covers that and miraculously turn you right back around in the right direction so you can live a life in response to the gospel. TLC, that is worship. It's understanding the depths of our own sin and depravity before a holy and righteous God and declaring, behold, you are Lord. You alone are worthy. Here is everything that we can humanly fathom, everything that you've done, are doing, and will do. Here's everything that you are. Now work in me through your Holy Spirit to live a life that recognizes you as Lord, not out of obligation or rules or regulations or laws, but out of love in response, in order to spread your kingdom for the glory of your name. That is how we behold Jesus Christ as Lord. And at this point, I'd like to invite Pastor Justin back up to continue our message. Let's give it up for Brandon. Wow. We could have just prayed right there, passed the plate, and called it a day. Wow. Thanks, Brandon. Um, as we continue, um, we're going to walk into this invitation of beholding his word of the Father. And we get this from the last stanza. It says this, Yea, Lord, we greet thee, born this happy morning, Jesus to thee, all glory given, word of the Father, now in flesh appearing. And where this comes from is one of my favorite passages in the book of John. So if you have that, John 1, starting in verse 1, and we'll read 14 and 18. But John 1, 1 says this, In the beginning was the... Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jumping down to 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed His glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. Jump down to 18. No one has ever seen God, the one and only Son, who, him, who is Himself God, is at the Father's side, he has revealed him. John, one of the people who hung out with Jesus a lot, who was a witness of Jesus and was a part of his ministry, accounted for this by writing this book here, the eyewitness account, to tell um, all who were reading this that Jesus was actually the Son of God, that the Word became flesh and the Word was God. This Jesus was divine and he became human from heaven. And the Word uh, word in Greek is this word logos, which essentially means reason or plan, okay? And in the context of the beginning, the word logos, reason or plan, is there to mean Jesus was always there. He was never created. He was never like born out of something in heaven. He was always existing from the start and to the end. He is always there. And more than that, it means that he, um, the relational dynamics between word and God means that he was God. Like Jesus is the son of God, but he also is God. We'll talk about that one day, but that is really hard to wrap your mind around. But the simple thing that you need to embrace is that Jesus was God from heaven sent down here among us. It's what this means, and the word was God. He came down to us in flesh. This is something to behold, because listen to this, church. What other religion or spiritual ideology can say that? When you think of Islam or Buddhism or Hinduism or fill-in-the-blank kind of ism that's not Christianity, all of them, you're earning something, you're fighting for enlightenment, or trying to strive for something that you already don't have. And the onus and the burden is on you. But Christianity says the burden is on you and you can't lift it up. 
You can't lift it off. So Jesus says, I'm coming to you because you can't do it. I love you enough to meet you where you are and your helpless state. You can't save yourself. You can't find it without me. And so God puts on our clothing, human skin and bones and says, I'm gonna show you plain as day how to find me, follow me and how you can have salvation. I love you enough not to let you on your own in your helpless state. Amazing. Imagine for a moment, you're at a Colorado's Rockies game, okay? And a friend's got a ticket for you and you're gonna meet them there. And imagine um, the point of meeting where you are, there's a lot of people there. I know that's hard to imagine at a Rockies game, all right? Because they're so bad. But imagine that there's a crowd of people at the place that you're supposed to meet your friend. And you say, I can't find my friend, so I'm gonna call him and you pick up the phone and you say, hey, Andy, because it's likely Andy's inviting me to a Rockies game. Andy, I can't find you. And what if Andy in the crowd of people says, oh, easy, I'm wearing a purple and white Rockies jersey and a, a Rockies hat. I'm, I'm right over here. Now, how frustrating and not helpful is that description in a crowd of people who are likely wearing the same exact thing? That is not helpful at all. The more helpful thing would be if Andy's on the phone with me, he goes, wait a minute. I can see you, Justin. In this crowd of people, I can see you. Don't move. I'm coming to you. And he walks through that crowd and comes and to me and finds me. The word becoming flesh is exactly what that illustration is pointing to. We couldn't find Jesus without his help. He knew in the mess and the chaos that he had to come to us in our helpless state. The word became flesh is Jesus coming to us. And that's what we were beholding, that there was no way we'd be able to find God without his help. Like the way back to God was only him coming to show us the way. That's what he says. I am the way, the truth, and the what? Life. But what's even more amazing is that Jesus gave up. Listen to this. I love this about him. He gave up his glory and traded up his throne in heaven. There's a word that I love that describes this action. And it's from a song that I love called Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. It says, look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to ransom us. And that word con condescending is usually when we're saying someone is belittling someone or putting someone down to uh, lift themselves up. Well, what Jesus did was condescend himself. He says, I'm considering myself less than. I'm taking myself from a position on high and lowering myself, becoming a human so I can pursue you. I'm giving up glory for humanness so I can show you the way. He intentionally viewed himself lower than he was and took on a lesser, lesser position as a man to help us in our lowest state. And what I want you to see here and what causes us to behold him is that Jesus is accessible. There's no elite God in our faith. He's made himself known. If you want access to him, he's there. He's made it known. He says, come, all who are weary and heavy laden. My burden is easy and my yoke is light. He's made himself there for us. There's no like thing that you've got to do to find him. He's made it available. And more than that, the word inspired people to write the word. Does that make sense? And so not only did he like come and have a ministry here, but he inspired people to document this and write letters and epistles and other things to instruct us forever until he returns on how to know him. So if you wanna know this God, open your Bible. His like literally DNA of who, is, of who he is, his nature, his character, who he is, what he's, what he's all about, who he was, what he will be isn't here. And so he's accessible. The word of God has given us his word. Everything we want to know about God is accessible to us. He came to show us. We are without excuse. This season, as we walk through Advent together, this is a reminder of beholding this invitation. This Christmas season is an invitation to behold the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, to put our focus on him. And to wrap up this point, before we conclude from the same book that Brandon read a couple verses earlier, 
from the same chapter and book, Paul goes on to say this about the one, Jesus. Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Listen to that. Go back. He knew his nature, and he didn't use it for selfish gain. He knew his power and might. Instead of using it for his own glory, he used it to serve others. Instead, he emptied himself. Think about that image. Jesus emptying himself to what? By assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. He came to serve. TLC, what makes our faith so incredible, why I love following Jesus and why you should too, is that he was the only one who could bridge the gap that we ourselves made. Like, I'm going to come and fix your mess because I'm the only one who can. And I pray that this season is a remembrance of the invitation to come and behold the one and only. Basically, this carol, carol, oh, come all you faithful, is essentially, again, an invitation, an invitation for us to come and behold King Jesus. But it's not lost on me that some of you today are probably not there. You're distracted, maybe cynical, your mind is elsewhere. You're just not in the mood. <laughs> I get it. But if I can take on the same position and enthusiasm as Posey with the train, let me encourage you to behold the king of kings. Let me encourage you to behold the king of angels, to behold the one, the Lord of all, the Lord that we bow down to. Let me encourage you to behold the word who became flesh. Let me also, but more than that, behold the one that loves you like crazy. Behold the one, Jesus, who knows every hair on your head. Behold the one, Jesus, who on your worst day, when you want to cuss at him, can take it. He's got thick skin and still loves you despite of that. And I want you to behold the one that in this season is working on your behalf, using his angels to fight for you, to minister to you, and behold the one who's the reason for this season. TLC. Behold Jesus. Let's pray. God, I pray that we take this invitation seriously. That we behold you for who you are and what you've promised to do and what you will ultimately do when you return. God, you are above everything. And in light of that, we surrender to you because you are actually the one in control. And we trust you. And we trust you because you took on humanness and flesh to lead us and to show us the way. You're a good father. And so, Father, we walk into this invitation. and We don't take it lightly. I pray that this season, this Christmas, would be the best one we've ever had. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.